All right, guys. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, as I had mentioned, um, we're recording this, so um, and it'll it'll be made publicly available in the next couple of days. But welcome to our first uh, webinar for the Sark and Spokane Community Adaptation Project. Um, just a quick note on housekeeping: if you wouldn't mind muting your phones, please, while our presenter our presenters are talking. Um, and then you can also feel free to enter your messages into the chat box, um, and then just be sure to unmute yourself when uh, there's qu time for question and answer. Um, my name is Ann Mooney. I'm here with the Climate Impacts Research Consortium at Oregon State University. Um, and we're excited to get started with our community adaptations project. So you'll see on your screen today, we have um, our agenda for the webinar. Um, we'll have a stakeholder panel. Um, so two of our CERC alumni will share about two of our past community adaptation projects. And you'll see that they're really different from each other and also very different from, from what we're going to end up doing in Spokane. Um, but, in, but it's an opportunity to talk about the process and working with CERC and, um, and also to get a chance for uh, our newest community adaptations project to interact with, our, with some of our alumni. Uh, so we'll have about 10 minutes for discussion after they're done. So I'd encourage you to jot down any questions you have, because um, it'll be a little bit of time before we have a chance to ask them. Um, and then in a couple of years down the road, this could be some of you guys um, sharing your experience with the next cohort of CERT Community Adaptations work. Um, after that, we will hear from Phil Moat um, about climate models and how they're developed and how they're used. And um, so Phil has a presentation for us, and then we'll be ready for uh, questions afterwards. And then we'll do a quick debrief and um, next steps and send everybody on their way. All right, I'm going to go ahead and change over our presenter privileges to our next, to our first stakeholder. Um, we're going to hear from Casey Dennehy with the Surf Riders, who worked with us on our Grays Harbor Coastal Futures project. So, Casey, it looks like your screen's up and you've got the floor. All right, thanks, Ann. Can you see my first slide? Yeah, all looks good. Thank you. All right, great. Well, um, again, my name is Casey Dennehy. I'm the Washington Coast Program Manager for the Surf Rider Foundation. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of the Surf Rider Foundation, we're a nonprofit organization that uh, protects the world's oceans, waves, and beaches through a chapter network. Um, my work specifically, though, uh, focuses a lot on uh, ocean policy. Um, I've been very involved in marine spatial planning as well as shoreline master plan updates out on the coast and uh, many other things. But um, yeah, I wanted to, before I start talking about the process and everything that we did with CERC, I actually thought it would be really useful to kind of just give a background on Grays Harbor County as um, it, I think it adds a lot of relevance and uh, more, it'll help you understand exactly why this uh, project is so important to us. So, um, um, Casey? Sorry. Sorry, Casey, can yeah. I just uh, break in one second? Um, we got a little bit of uh, feedback, it sounds like. So if you're not on mute um, and you're not Casey, please go ahead and mute yourself um, and we'll try to limit that feedback. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ann. Uh, so yeah, Grace Harbor County. Um, it is a coastal county. It's um, sent on the central coast, essentially due west of Olympia. Um, we have very long sandy beaches and we're really a community that is very dependent on our marine resources. Um, some of the big industries are fishing, um, shellfish aquaculture, as well as recreation and tourism. Um, for, actually, the Surfrider Foundation conducted a recreational use study in 2014, and we found that there were 4.1 million trips to the coast in one year, and that generated $481 million in direct expenditures. Um, actually, each year since then, we've seen um, uh, double-digit growth um, percentage-wise, um, so I'm sure those numbers are even higher these days. But uh, the whole point is that we are very, um, you know, resource dependent economy and the beaches are very important to us. Um, on top of that, uh, you know, just a little 
understanding of the, the makeup of our shoreline, um, we are relatively, um, we're, we're not developed too much, like relative to like the area of Seattle, um, but we do have um, houses and infrastructure essentially along the entire coastline, um, even though it's not very dense. But, um, you know, we do have, uh, like I said, we've got a lot of people there um, and uh, very uh, tied to our coast and our beaches. Um, one of the things that we face, though, are a lot of different coastal hazards. Um, I lived, I had a beach house for five years on the coast and uh, saw this firsthand. Um, in the wintertime, we get hammered by storms, um, extremely high winds, big surf. Um, I think there was a buoy reading last winter for a storm that hit 60 feet. Um, and with that comes some pretty uh, devastating consequences. Um, we have been losing shoreline. Here's a picture in Westport of, the con of uh, some condos that were built in the 90s. Uh, when these were constructed, they were actually 180 feet from the, from the dune. So you can see that we have lost uh, a lot of beach. This, uh, this was one, of course, amazing storm. It was basically three storms in, uh, in eight days and eight, eight, eight away um, more each time. But, this isn't something that's uh, unique. We've seen this uh, over many years. There's also a situation that's similar up in uh, ocean shores. Um, and actually just south of our county line in Pacific County, we have um, uh, an area that we call Washaway Beach. And you can see here that we literally have houses falling into the ocean. Um, this is, this uh, area actually has the greatest erosion in the lower 48 states. So. So, yeah, basically, I mean, we have a, a lot of natural threats and, uh, and a crazy environment to work with. Um, and on top of that, uh, we have the threat of uh, sea level rise. Um, we, we know that it's, we're going to have um, a couple of feet by 2100. Um, it could be worse. You can see this is just a, a map produced a couple of years ago by the Nature Conser Conservancy throwing, showing inundation levels um, on different scenarios. So. Um, the bottom line is that we, um, you know, we're basically, uh, we, we have threats that we know are on the horizon and we need to plan accordingly. So uh, that is where CERC came in. Um, I, I was introduced to this team, um, I was actually at a Surfrider chapter conference in Long Beach, I believe in 2015. And uh, I met John Stevenson, who uh, did some work for the Surfrider Foundation and he actually gave a presentation on on some uh, on a project they worked on in Tillamook County, very similar to what we ended up doing in Grays Harbor. Um, so I was really excited to see what uh, he had done, and even better, he told me that uh, they had secured funding to do something similar in Grays Harbor County. Um, so I started working with them, and uh, I was well suited to that because I sit on many boards and am really involved with the community. Um, specifically, I was the at the time the chair of the Grace Harbor County Marine Resource Committee. So we um, we, we tapped our network, and we we uh, I worked with the CERT team, and we invited as many influential and interested individuals as we could to this process. So. Um, Basically, what they planned on doing here is looking, uh, using really powerful modeling software, um, they, they, they plugged that in and were, wanted to get outputs and show what the shoreline looks like based on different um, policy scenarios. So uh, I know this is, I, I hope, don't want you to read all these, uh, just showing this is one of the outputs and some of the stuff that we worked on, but um, like, on the left side are the scenarios, and so the four that we kind of looked at was baseline, which is basically if we don't do anything, we continue uh, doing things as we're doing today. Um, another op option would be realign, which is really would be moving infrastructure, physically removing infrastructure out of uh, areas, the hazard areas. Um, third one was just, was restore, so really focusing on restoring habitat. Um, and the fourth one was protection. And so for that, that would include um, hard armoring and, and beach nourishment. So at the first meeting, um, which was in, uh, let's see, I think June, I check my notes here. It was February of 2016. Um, 
the the team came and gave a, a background on what uh, well they they showed what they had done in Tillamook County and we started talking about what uh, how we could really do something similar in Grace Harbor County but uh, they really what they they asked us to help define uh, these different scenarios as well as what the priorities were for the for the community um, so for us like I said we are very tourism uh, uh, focused uh, economy out here so like beach access was something that's very important to us and so that's something that they mapped how these different scenarios would impact that another thing if you remember my first slide i had uh it was during a uh, razor clam dig and that's a huge draw um when it's the right season and so we also we, we indicated that and so they all actually started doing the modeling to see what the razor clam habitat and how that would be impacted by these different scenarios. Um, so they they took all that feedback and they started pumping it into the models. And um, they had, uh, there is a wealth of data that they produced. This is just one snapshot showing um, how beach access would be uh, impacted by uh, these four different scenarios. And if you look at the at the bottom one, you can see that there's quite a bit of variability depending on what we um, what we choose to do moving forward. Um, well, oh, actually, before I go there, one other thing I wanted to add is uh, they came back and showed us the first iteration of their modeling, and I believe that was uh, last year in April. April 2017, and they asked for some more input. And one of the uh, really thoughtful um, comments that somebody said is, you know, we really should probably put a cost uh, limit on some of these activities. For for example, like armoring, you know, um, it's it's quite expensive to move rock and put it on the shoreline. Um, and the truth is, uh, Grace Harbor County is a relatively poor. Uh, economy we've got a very low tax base and we can't just throw money at this thing we can only put so much towards it. our resources are limited so so they went back and they were uh, built in um, caps on the cost and that spending so that was a really helpful input and just another uh, example that you know uh, uh, you uh, that, that they listened to the concerns of the stakeholders and were uh, were adapting to that so um, so they went back and uh, they ran the models again with our last round of input, and this was in April 2018. Uh, they demonstrated uh, the last, well, the almost final scenarios, and we got one more chance to look at them and provide a little bit of uh, feedback. So, um, yeah, it's really amazing data. I, it's it's very hard to describe uh, how much is how much they produced. Um, but it, it's plentiful and it'll be really helpful moving forward. Um, we um, plan on using this information really to, to make some hard decisions about how we manage our coastline in the future. Um, there's no silver bullet. We're going to lose either habitat or beach access um, or both, but um, this information I think will be really helpful in allowing us to at least make informed decisions. A um, couple of takeaways that I had for this was that, um, first of all, you know, I thought working with the CERC team was, it was, it was really a pleasure. They're very engaging and receptive and, um, you know, sometimes uh, people out on the coast are, uh, aren't as welcoming to outsiders, but they came in with an open mind and um, were well received by the community. Uh, one of the other things is that, you know, the better input you give to them, the better output you can get. I think that, um, that one demonstration about adding a limit to cost was a good example of that. Um, and also, oh, and it looks like my internet may have dropped, but that was my last slide anyway. Um, so uh, anyway, I wanted to say, think about uh, how the data is going to be used because you can, that will inform, you know, I think how they might use their modeling or work on their project. Um, and, and the last thing I want to add is just make sure to include decision makers. Um, it might be tempting to have just technical experts uh, in the room, but I think the more inclusive you are, uh, the better. Uh, decision makers will then, you know, be able to see the complexities of the work or the issue you guys are trying to to learn about, and um, you know that that 
really sets you up later for um, having them behind the project and, you know, understanding the issue and being able to make the uh, difficult decisions. So um, that's it for me. Um, looks like Ann's working, getting there to my last slide. Um, my contact information is there at the bottom uh, in case you want to reach out to me in the future. So thank you. Thanks so much, Casey. That was that was fantastic, and we almost made it all the way without. Um, <laughs> we almost made it all the way with your internet. That was that was fantastic. Well, at least we had the backup, you know. Yeah, Chaos exactly. Here. Bounds, yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. All right. So, Kavita, if you are ready, we're going to go ahead and jump right into your talk. Perfect. Okay, sounds good. So um, I'm going to have Anne advance the slides for me to reduce technical difficulties. Um, so uh, my name is Kavita Hine, and I am the Climate Science Program Manager at the Portland Water Bureau, which is the drinking water utility for Portland, Oregon. And I just really appreciate Cirque inviting me to this uh, webinar today and with the chance to share some of the lessons we learned from our project with Cirque um, several years ago. And the project was called Piloting Utility Modeling Applications, or PUMA for short. And the real goal of this project, which I'm going to talk a lot about today, is um, was co-producing actionable climate science with researchers. So science that we collaborate collaboratively developed together between resource managers and scientists and don't do it in separate silos. So a lot of the lessons I'm going to share with you today are about that process and some thoughts I have on um, a, a Spokane CERT project and things you might want to think about moving forward with yours. So go ahead, Em. Next slide. I wanted to give you guys a bit of background of Portland's water system um, because it will set the context similar to what Casey did. So our drinking water system in Portland serves about a million people in the Portland metropolitan area. And we have two water supplies, as you can see on this map. So our primary surface water supply is the Bull Run watershed, which is located to the east of Portland. And then we also have, uh, and this is a really wet, uh, temperate rainforest. Um, we also have a secondary supply, which is a groundwater aquifer system located on the Columbia River to the north of Portland, which you can see in blue identified on the map. And this groundwater system is a really important source of short-term and long-term supply resilience for our Bull Run watershed system. Go ahead, Anne. So um, we have invested in uh, planning for climate change uh, for more than 20 years, and we've been doing this work for a long time. But a recent wake-up call occurred in 2015 when the Northwest region experienced really record-breaking temperatures and record low snowpacks and extremely dry conditions. And probably many of you in Spokane will have witnessed some of the impacts this had in your region as well. Um, so this was a real um, preview of the future, what a warmer future looks like for us. And for our drinking water system, these conditions led to the longest drawdown of our Bull Run City reservoirs. Um, as you can see here, they were pretty low. And the largest groundwater use in a single year. So we have to use our groundwater supply when our surface supply is, is not sufficient for summertime demand. So this was kind of um, record breaking for ourselves and uh, really made a lot of people in our agency recognize that um, conditions changing like this can be very challenging. In addition to being um, concerned about water supply, we also are concerned about water quality. And I think this is one of the impacts in the Northwest that water resource managers should be thinking equally about um, and not just water quantity. Because in the Northwest, um, we have a lot of important resources that rely, rely on water temperature. Our agency is required to manage stream temperature for endangered salmon in our downstream parts of our watershed. And also, for drinking water, you need to have cold water. It's easier to treat, and it has less complicated problems. Um, and so it can be more costly and challenging to treat uh, warmer water. So this was a real challenge in 2015, and this was a very much uh, kind of an indicator of what challenges we might face with climate change in the future. Um, and in fact, 2015 is supposed to be like the 
average conditions by the middle of the century, at least the wintertime conditions, according to recent uh, science by Phil Moat and others in the region. So it was an important uh, test case and stress test for our system. So go ahead, Anne. Um, so I just wanted to kind of frame the evolution of our climate change planning at the Portland Water Bureau and give you the context for how the CERC uh, helps us. So we had historically worked with either researchers or consultants um, and asked them to produce us reports on what climate change would mean for our drinking water system. So in the early 2000s, we commissioned a report that um, was done by the University of Washington, which used climate models available at the time. And um, it made some big uh, statements about exactly how much uh, reduction in water supply we, we would have in the future with climate change and uh, what we would need to do to uh, adapt. Not long after this report was published, our system dynamics changed significantly. Noticeably, water demand decreased, and we had more of a buffer than we had thought because people were coming, becoming more efficient with their use of water through the 90s and early 2000s. So the study had a very short shelf life and became irrelevant very quickly. And we really learned from this experience that one of the key things we wanted to do was to be able to plan for climate change adaptively and over time iteratively, and also to build capacity internally to do this within our own agency. So go ahead, Anne. So enter the PUMA project. Um, and again, this st stands for Piloting util Utility Modeling Application. And the real goal of PUMA was to help us build tools and expertise that we could use in-house. There were three main components to our PUMA project with the CERC. We wanted to develop a hydrologic model for our watershed. We wanted to localize climate data for the Bull Run watershed, and we wanted to build that internal capacity to use these tools and data sets moving forward in the future. And so the theme across all of these objectives was the co-production of actionable science. So I just wanted to find that because it's going to be an important part of the project you guys embark on with CERC. Go ahead, Anne. So um, what is co-production? Well, I just wanted to highlight a few um, definitions of this from the Water Utility Climate Alliance, which is a group that Portland is part of. So co-production is a, basically a collaborative venture between scientists and decision makers. It's not the typical loading dock model of, of science where your climate information is generated with the re by researchers and is put out on the web and then a decision maker or resource manager then decides what to do with it. Instead, you're doing this collabor collaboratively and developing the information and data you need to answer your specific resource management questions. And equally, it is not, um, you can't really expect the scientists to, to uh, fulfill all the needs that decision makers have. You're going to have to bring information to the table, as Casey also described. So that's a really important part of co-production. And again, it's an iterative and collaborative process, so that's very key. So I just want to highlight a handful of lessons learned from our co-production effort with the CERC on this project. So go ahead, Anne. The lesson learned that I want to start with is that developing partnerships with the science, um, science community and, and with CERC is really key. Um, through the Puma project, our agency was really able to build upon existing and develop new partnerships with regional climate scientists, and those relationships benefit us to this day in the work we're continuing to do. So we worked with University of Washington, University of Idaho, and Oregon State University, and these were some of the partners that worked closely with us on the uh, Puma project. And getting to know and work with the scientists on a regular basis was really a high point in our project. And it really changed the dynamics of our relationship with the research community, as I've mentioned. So we're really thankful to our, uh, these partners in CERC to, uh, who were able to engage with us. As a result of PUMA, we're a very strong supporter of the RESA program, which is funded by NOAA. Um, it's what funds the CERC and other similar regional um, collaborative groups across the country. Go ahead, uh, Anne. The second lesson I think that we have learned that's really important um, is that you really need to know your system, or you could replace this with the word resource or community. You really want to understand its dynamics before you really tackle the question of what the vulnerabilities are with climate change. So we spent a lot of try time in our project trying to understand the hydrology of our watershed um, and what had made it 
so-called so fail in the past where we had had challenges in dealing with our water supply or water uh, quality management. And we could have done a better job conveying all of this context and historical institutional knowledge to the scientists. And I think that we learned later in the project that we would have been better to do that upfront. So I really encourage you guys to think about what can you share about your system or your resource that you're going to be looking at with the CERC folks so that they can help you find the best available science for your adaptation efforts. Um, and more knowledge and information can be uncovered throughout the process, but this is a key starting point. Go ahead, Anne. So um, the third theme that I, oh, you can click again. Uh, the third theme that I mentioned already that I just want to highlight again is it's so critical, I think, to build adaptive capacity within either your community or agency to plan for climate change. One of the key things we learned from the Puma Project and over the last 20 years that we've been planning for climate change is that it is a process. You will not have all the answers you need in, you know, in a couple year project. So you want to think about the resources, the staff, the stakeholders that you want to bring along in this process with you. We've spent a lot of time uh, since the Puma Project and after investing in you know, bringing on more staff, but also engaging staff within our city and agency um, in climate change assessment work so that it becomes mainstream in how you think about planning for the future. And I can't emphasize this point enough. And then go ahead, Anne. Um, and then finally, uh, one more click. Uh, I want to highlight the importance of planning for multiple futures. So as Casey described, you are going to see and then come across a lot of information from the modeling. And sometimes it can be very overwhelming. This is something we experienced. There's a very big spread in some of the model projections for certain variables of interest, especially when you're thinking about a very localized system. Because, you know, climate change is, is in all effect is global, but it's also very local. And so one of the things that we have found is key in adapting to the future is to not get paralyzed by the amount of information, but actually use it as use the climate models and tools in a way to illustrate the future because they can do that. And you, by that, you, uh, you can understand what future conditions could occur, and there'll be a range of them. So, for example, let me pra you know, make this more pragmatic. If you're a water system, you want to be thinking about planning for droughts and floods, not one or the other, right? So that's the idea of planning for multiple futures. So um, you're not looking at every single um, outcome that could occur because the climate models are not predictive, but they're very powerful in informing what the future could look like. So that is one thing that we have learned and has become a really important retrospective um, in moving forward because we're using the data and tools from the CERC project in our water system supply planning process right now as we speak. Go ahead, Anne. Um, so to sum it all up, go ahead, one more. I just wanted to uh, read you guys a quote from our Director of Resource Protection and Planning who had an opportunity to observe the Puma project um, kind of up close and also from afar. And I think this really describes the transformative effect that working with the CERC had on our agency. So I'll just quickly read it for you. So his name's Edward Campbell, and he said, the Puma Project has been the catalyst for significant growth in the sophistication of the Portland Water Bureau. The growth was generated from a climate-related focus, but the lessons learned as newly acquired tools are finding their way into supply operations, long-term planning within our engineering planning group as well. This culture change is just in its infancy, but it's notable, and working with our uh, Water Utility Climate Alliance partners and um, climate hey, Rebecca, scientists. Rebecca, can you go ahead and mute yourself, please? Oh, Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Kavita, would you mind starting at starting at the beginning? We're we're getting some pretty bad feedback. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I mean, people can read this themselves, but basically, he's saying the Puma Project has catalyzed a lot of growth for our agency um, that was coming from a climate-related focus, but has had a transformative effect on our entire agency, actually, in the way we plan for the future. So it's actually a cultural change, not just a technical change that we're undergoing right now. And a lot of that has to do with the tools and data we developed uh, with the CERC through this Puma project. And it's led to a more meaningful process of planning, decision-making, and communications. So this is a resounding, I think, success, the Puma project for our agency. And as I said, we're continuing to use the tools and data moving forward. And I hope that your guys' engagement with the CERC has as transformative an effect on the Spokane community as well. 
Um, and then I just wanted to end with my, I think it's my last slide, my contact information. If you have questions about um, our experiences and lessons learned, there's also a report uh, on the Puma project um, that illustrates not just our case study, but three other water utilities that went through a similar process with uh, other climate scientists. So you can access this report from the Water Utility Climate Alliance um, website, and it's called Actionable Science in Practice. So with that, I'll be happy to end. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kavita. That was um, that was very very awesome, and thank you so much, Casey. Um, that was great. It's it's always wonderful to hear from you guys because we can we can talk as much as we you know as about our experience from the CERC side, but it's also really really great to hear from our stakeholders about um, the impact on the on the community. Um, we have we have plenty of time actually. We've got about 13 minutes um, for discussion. Um, so hopefully you guys have some good questions to um, ask Casey and Kavita while we have them. Um, I'll just remind you if you want to talk, please unmute yourself. Or if you um, if you prefer, or joining us without a microphone, um, you can type your question to me in the chat box, and we'll make sure that it, it gets read aloud. Right. So with that, anyone up for the first question? All right, well then I have a question, um, if I can kick things off. Um, so Casey and Kavita, this is to both of you. Um, thinking back now over the process, what do you guys, if, if there's anything, what do you guys wish you had known um, kind of as you, when you started the process working with CERC? Go ahead, Casey, if you wanna respond first. Okay, sure. Um, well, um, I kind of, I'll go back to the, what I mentioned about engaging um, uh, local elected officials. <clears throat> and uh, we did a pretty good job of that. Early on we had um, one or two mayors, um, some city council members, and one of our county commissioners. But um, as a couple of later meetings, we ran into scheduling issues. So what would have been really helpful would have been uh, really getting the uh, regularly scheduled meetings for those different government agencies um, on the books so that you kind of avoid conflicts. Um, I, I guess, you know, kind of the takeaway is that really the more people, <clears throat> excuse me, the more people you get in the room, the better. Um, as Kavita mentioned, you know, this is a collaborative process and um, uh, the more people at the table, uh, the more input and the better, um, I guess, buy-in you'll have. Yeah, in my addition, I just want to emphasize the point about really knowing your system first. Um, you got to understand what makes it tick and what makes it fail before you can understand what climate change in a warmer future means for your community or your system. So spend time understanding that first before you look at the changes and convey as much of that information as possible to the scientists. This um, this happened in multiple ways to us in our project that I won't go into in details, but it got very complicated when we tried to look at models, model calibration and ensure that the models were able to replicate our historical observed conditions before we could even project the future changes in our hydrology. So just really understanding the basics and not assuming the scientists are experts overnight in your system or community I think is really helpful. Mm. Yeah, any, any, did you want to add something Casey to that? Um, no, I mean, that, is, that of course is a great point. Um, I think we, we had a pretty good <clears throat> understanding of what we were facing. Um, I think, you know, there's always challenges to science, especially with the, uh, you know, for us looking at sea level rise, there's a lot of uncertainty, but uh, the best available science, uh, you, you use what you got, but um, yeah. For sure, thank you. Um, okay, and we have a question from the chat box. Um, so I, I believe, Casey and Kavita, this is to both of you again. Um, what was the role, if any, of tribal partners within your project? Hmm. 
Good question. Um, we we invited some tribal members. Um, there, tri um, the tribes have a very big presence on the Washington coast, but actually there are no, well, there's the Quinault Indian Nation um, is uh, on the northern part of Grace Harbor, and they were there for, for part of it. Um, you know, they can be, they're very busy as well. Um, so I would say it was a mix. Uh, it was, um, we could, it could have been better, but we did have some uh, some involvement. Yeah, and for us, there wasn't any involvement from tribal partners. Um, we don't generally involve a lot of tribal partners, but we do have some tribal cultural res resources in our watershed. Mo the Bull Run is very unique. It is um, there's completely prohibited public access in the Bull Run. It's a congressional mandate. So no one is allowed in unless they are authorized in, which is very exceptional globally, actually. Um, not That's not to say that partners aren't important, but a lot of the work we did was internal within our agency. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Um, Phil, did you have a question? Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Casey and Kavita. This was really great hearing, uh, hearing from both of you. Um, in some ways, uh, very different projects, obviously. Um, and, you know, in both cases, uh, so this might be too difficult a question for you, so my apologies, but um, <laughs> in, in the case of the, the Great Harbor County project, you know, we used this Envision modeling framework, which, as Casey described, allowed us to um, input all sorts of data and do, and you know, interact with the community about their values and priorities and, and reflect those in the modeling. Um, and and it, was, it was sort of a way to focus the conversation. Um, in the case of the Puma project with Portland Water Bureau, yeah, you know, you were very much in the driver's seat. You had a, a clear desire for uh, what you wanted from us, and uh, that was, um, you know, the driving force uh, behind the project. Um, it, it, uh, we're, we're in new territory working with Spokane because uh, we didn't come in with, uh, you know, a modeling tool that we intended to use that would focus the conversation. Um, we didn't um, have a, a, you know, very narrowly defined uh, outcome or mission. And, and, you know, so the group is, is in a phase of um, really uh, still identifying what the, um, uh, uh, you know, Topics of interest are, and what the what the outcome of the project should be, and and who should participate, and all that. Um, so, if, if you can imagine a, a you know a less constrained uh, process and project, um, can you think of of uh, things that from your experience that would would be applicable? Yes, I have a couple <laughs> thoughts, and, and then I'll punch it to Casey, maybe if that's okay. Um, I am a little biased, but I do think that water resources are the canary in the coal mine for climate change, especially in the West. So I think um, that it's an important thing to look at for a community, the vulnerability of your water systems. Um, but I also think another driver for prioritizing the focus for a community could be the cost or investments that the community is making, decisions that you're going to be making for the long haul that you want to think about um, now and, and understand, like, do you need to design that infrastructure or that investment differently to be able to adapt to a, a changing climate? And so those are two things that I would definitely consider amongst the plethora of things you could look at with climate change. Yeah, I don't have much else to add. I think that's a really good point. Um, I do think um, you want to think about where you're going to end up. So what is what might those decisions be made, whether that's how you use your local water supply or or what else, and then work backwards to, so that you can answer that question thoroughly. I think one other thing that would be a challenge, um, having such an open-ended uh, opportunity, is that you might try to do uh, try to have a much a project that's way too broad, and that can kind of, uh, I would think, just make the make it um, expand the project in a way that um, you might not get any like a, just a more diluted product. Product. So, I think probably focusing in and find and looking at one 
uh, issue in particular and understanding that extremely well uh, would be a good approach. I actually totally back that up, and I think, you know, starting somewhere and then viewing this as a process of planning for climate change over many years is a really good way to approach it. You're building the tools and the capacity to look at maybe one issue, but then thinking about how you can use those tools and data with on other issues um, moving forward in time. I think that's a really great approach. Thanks. Very, very good advice. Thanks, guys. That's, that's awesome. Good advice. Um, one more question from the, uh, also from the chat. Um, were there already water system models before this project? Um, I'm assuming that's to you, Kavita? Uh, sure. Uh, no, there were not. Um, there was not a hydrologic model. So we built it from scratch and we actually compared different hydrologic models and picked the one we felt was most appropriate, and it was not the most costly one, I will emphasize. So sometimes simplicity is just as valuable. You want to make sure you can operate and maintain a model and understand its outputs. We do have a reservoir operations model, but the tools we developed with the CERC were new. Yeah, I mean, we. I would just say that our, ours is a little bit different, but um, we did rely on um, sea level rise projections and um, well the, the scientific experts with CERC were able to identify the uh, the best models and we went we we went forward with um, most likely projection for sea level rise at uh, in 2100 um, the truth is there's a lot of variability in uh, what people think uh, the sea sea level will be at that time but um, in a way, uh, it's kind of moot because we will hit that level of C eventually. It just is a matter of uh, when that year is. So, great. Um, thank, thanks, you guys, and thanks for sending in some questions as well. Um, oh, hang on, one more coming in. There's so another question from the chat box is how will you promote community adoption and understanding? So I think this is to deal with the um, kind of getting broad engagement throughout your community, your best recommendations, or, or how you're going to do that within your community and how that could apply to Spokane. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, so, uh, it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of effort is uh, the the true answer um, and it'll be multi pronged. Um, there's gonna be a huge uh, you know kind of education and outreach component of it. We need to get this information into the hands of decision makers and um, that includes local elected officials, but also organizations that are looking at this issue. And so um, I'm involved with the marine resource committees and we'll be sharing that with all of them up and down the coast and they have their own networks that they can use to uh, get that information out there. Um, we also um, Actually, we're very lucky that um, we have a governor's board called the Washington Coast Marine Advisory Council, uh, which I also serve on, and we have started looking at coastal at, um, coastal resiliency and what that means. And so we're really, um, the communities are very aware of the challenges that we have ahead. Um, we don't know exactly what it looks like, but um, as we start moving into that process, um, this information I think will be really helpful as we start to um, think about how we react. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is we will certainly be able to use this information as we update our shoreline master plans. Uh, we actually just did that in both uh, Pacific and Grace Harbor counties, but um, uh, we're supposed to be doing that every eight years um, from here on out. So um, hopefully it will help us inform some of the, uh, the policies that we develop uh, in those plans. So um, I'll just chime in for Portland. You guys might want to check out Portland's climate uh, change preparation strategy, which is basically an adaptation strategy for the city, which includes not just our effects on the water system, but other components. So it might give you some ideas on what to focus on. And as part of that larger effort for the city, we actually engage the community pretty broadly, including having a steering committee of people from nonprofits and community groups, including tribal partners, um, 
as part of that um, effort to develop the overall strategy. And equity was a very important component of uh, Portland's Climate Action Plan and Climate Change Preparation Strategy. And so it was very important for the city to engage with low-income communities and communities of color to understand equity impacts from climate change. Thanks, guys. Um, those are some great, great points, and I really appreciate um, Casey and Kavita, um, your guys' time today. Um, at this point, um, I'm going to turn things over to Phil. Um, and also, um, guys, if, for everybody else on the phone, if other things come up, um, you know, questions or, or things like that, please feel free to reach out to um, either Casey or Kavita or, or send questions and comments to, to me, and I'm happy to pass those along and, and share them out. Um, but just thank you again, you guys. Um, that, was, that was really wonderful and uh, really great to hear kind of your thoughtful kind of distillation of your processes in, in two different, different areas and projects. Thank you. Um, yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, all right. So now we're gonna do. We're gonna shift gears now. Um, I hope nobody gets whiplash as we do this. Uh, so we spent the last few minutes kind of peeking under the curtain of and understanding two different projects um, and sort of the steps and recommendations under these. Um, how kind of supporting CERC's process in developing projects and, and where they go and sort of how they, how they evolve. And at this point, we're going to transition now to looking at the steps and processes that go into developing the climate model. So you guys remember Phil Mote from his um, presentation in May. Um, he's going to be helping, um, helping us think through and, and think about how climate scientists develop their develop their projections, what model outputs kind of can and can't tell us, and, and how we can use that information. So I'm going to turn things over to Phil. You should be able to see his slides there. And um, also, remember, we'll have time for discussion um, after this presentation. So um, this stuff can get a little complicated, so I'll encourage you again to just to jot down your questions and, and your thoughts as we go along. Thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks, everybody. Um, so as I was uh, uh, thinking about the, the talk uh, uh, that I'm about to give this morning, um, I, I, you know, I was reminded that um, the first climate modeling study to incorporate a doubled CO2 scenario was published in 1967. Uh, more than 50 years ago. So this is, in a sense, a very mature field. And their estimate of the uh, global temperature change with the doubled carbon dioxide uh, was pretty much what we're still getting from the most complicated models we have today. Um, even though that was a very simple two-layer atmosphere, uh, very coarse resolution, they got the basic physics good enough to, to get that answer. So. Um, my own involvement with climate modeling was during my PhD dissertation at University of Washington in the early 90s, and I had the great privilege to spend time at the National Center for Atmospheric Research with folks who uh, developed um, one of the world's leading uh, global climate models. Um, and I've uh, since stopped running global models, but uh, here at Ocri we run regional models. So I'll, I'll talk generally about global modeling and then how it applies uh, here in the Northwest. Um, so I'm going to uh, say a little bit about um, experimental science uh, versus earth science. Um, we're, we're, we're taught about science in school in a way that makes it seem as if, you know, we, ha we always have control. Um, uh, just one slide on summary of the relevant physics of the climate system. Uh, uh, a little bit about uh, recent climate changes, climate modeling basics, evaluating models, and future projections, and then finally uh, downscaling with uh, a regional model. So with experimental science, you know, think of, you know, biology or chemistry. Um, you have some hypothesis and you have a repeatable procedure. Uh, the, the, it's very important that scientists control the aspects of the experiment in order to isolate the important factors. Um, and by contrast, uh, with earth science, um, the way we test hypotheses is simply by observing nature. Uh, we uh, have little or no control over the system. We might um, try an experiment. Um, some have, for instance, 
uh, taken a section of forest and gassed it with CO2. Uh, that's a very difficult way to intervene, but, but it has been done. So this is a really, really complex system when you think of the atmosphere, the ocean, the sea ice, um, and it's so complicated that um, uh, one way that we uh, study the Earth system is by building computer models. So, so that's, that's the, the motivation for climate models. Uh, basically, we're doing a gigantic experiment on our only planet, and um, we don't have a control planet that we can compare it with, but, so we build one in, in models. Um, and this is what I mean by the experiment. Um, we've known, uh, scientists have known for uh, well over 120 years that carbon dioxide traps heat in Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and since 1957, we've had um, direct measurements from the top of Mauna Loa uh, uh, Observatory in Hawaii, uh, thanks to um, Dave Keeling. Uh, so it's now called the Keeling Curve. So what you see, each dot is a, a one-month average of CO2, um, and you can see it climbing slowly uh, and then a little faster uh, in the 90s and faster still recently. You can also see the annual breathing of the biosphere uh, Plants take, take in CO2 as they grow in, in the northern spring, and so the CO2 amounts go down a little bit. Um, but we passed uh, permanently the 400 parts per million uh, level uh, a few years ago, and uh, we're, we're now at, as of April, 411. It'll, it'll be a little bit lower right now. Um, and, and to get a sense of how big a change this is, um, this graph shows CO2 uh, over the entire period of human civilization. So 10,000 years ago was when the first uh, signs of, of agriculture began to appear, which paved the way for the technological development. So you can see that for the first 9,800 or so of the years on this graph, um, CO2 stayed very close to 270 parts per million. And uh, in the late 19th century, we figured out uh, how much easier it was to get energy from coal. So we started digging it up and burning coal and then oil and natural gas, uh, essentially reversing a geologic process uh, in the blink of an eye. So we're now um, well more than 100 parts per million above the, uh, the entire, uh, uh, the, the value in the entire human uh, civilization. And going back even farther, this shows the last 800,000 years. Uh, these are from ice cores in Antarctica. Um, and so uh, w you can see a sort of sawtooth shape here. The low CO2 values correspond with ice ages, and the high CO2 values are what are called interglacials. And so the difference in CO2 between pre-industrial and now is bigger than the difference between an ice age and an interglacial. Um, so, you know, how the planet will respond to this very sudden increase in CO2 is, is an incredibly important question. Um, and uh, and that's why we have climate models. Uh, as you can see, there is no analog um, in the ice core record for a time when CO2 was this high. And in fact, um, we have to go back tens of millions of years to find a period when CO2 was this high. And what we do find when we go back that far are, are startling differences from, from the modern climate. So um, climate models become really important because uh, they're uh, the best way to apply the relevant physics and understand uh, where uh, where the planet might be going. So just a little bit of climate physics. Um, all of all, all sorts of things can potentially influence the climate. Um, the ocean uh, moves heat around through the ocean circulation. Um, it is a net sink of carbon, so it's sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's also returning CO2 to the atmosphere in, in other places. Um, it absorbs solar radiation. The ocean is very dark, so it absorbs heat. Um, there are cloud feedbacks. Uh, so both high clouds and low clouds have different effects on the heat balance of the surface. Uh, to understand why clouds are important, think about a, uh, a, a very uh, clear winter night and how much colder it can be than a night in winter when it's cloudy. Um, conversely, on a, 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 a sunny summer day, um, if clouds move in, you won't, you won't see uh, such high uh, daytime high temperatures. 
Um, ice and snow um, are very reflective, and melting those uh, ex generally exposes a much darker surface and, a surface, and that's what's called the albedo feedback. Albedo simply uh, refers to reflectivity. Um, so warming a little bit melts uh, white stuff, which then leads to additional warming. Um, and then uh, in the lower right, you see emissions. So humans came along, and as I mentioned, uh, over the last uh, roughly 130 years or so, we've been uh, adding CO2 and, in fact, other greenhouse gases uh, to the atmosphere. Um, and uh, so there, there are other things on here, but um, the pluses are processes that generally respond to warming by increasing the warming, uh, and the minuses are processes that decrease the warming. Uh, so, in order to understand how this system will respond to rising CO2, we need to be able to quantify all of these processes and compare the magnitude of the feedbacks with uh, our best estimates of those from, uh, from the observations. And, and so that's what climate models try to do. The way that, uh, numerically the, that scientists have approached this uh, task is to divide both the atmosphere and the ocean and the land into grid cells. So you see a bunch of um, sort of trapezoidal uh, shapes uh, on the surface. And then the atmosphere has three-dimensional boxes uh, that typically go up to an altitude of uh, 30 miles, 50 kilometers, uh, maybe higher. Uh, in some cases, the ocean uh, typically uh, uh, tightly resolves the surface layer of the ocean where a lot of interesting things are happening and then uses uh, bigger spacing going down to the bottom. But um, typically a climate model will have um, uh, a million or so uh, of these boxes to keep track of and um, you know hundreds of thousands if not a million lines of code representing all of the processes uh, in the previous diagram. Now, uh, one, one of the important decisions modelers make is, is the spatial uh, resolution. So in the upper left is, is a resolution that's called T42, and I uh, don't want to try to explain what the T stands for. I can if you really want. Um, that was a typical resolution when I was doing my uh, dissertation back in the 90s. Um, uh, T85, so the, the colors indicate the, the, the altitude of the terrain. So you can see that with T42, um, the terrain in North America basically consists of one mountain range in the west, um, that's the Rockies with a, a bump roughly where uh, Colorado and Wyoming are. Um, and then you can also sort of see the Appalachians out, out on the east. So clearly, um, that is not going to be very useful for studying anything on the scale of uh, even the continent, uh, because the, the mountain ranges, of course, are extremely important out west. T85 on the right is slightly higher resolution, so you can uh, start to see a little bit of texture out west. Uh, the Cascades in Washington show up, for example. Uh, T170 is, is better still. You're starting to see the Columbia Plateau, for example, and the California Central Valley. Um, and then T340 uh, is, is quite a fine mesh. Now, as climate models have developed, um, modelers have typically chosen to stay with somewhat lower resolution, uh, kind of on the order of T85, and add lots and lots of processes. So the models are, are, are now representing um, plants and their interaction with the atmosphere, uh, sea ice, and a lot of other things uh, with much better detail uh, rather than focusing on the spatial resolution. Now, this is an enterprise that requires uh, a vast investment of uh, human resources and computing power, and there are about uh, 15 labs around the world that produce climate models, um, and you can see where they're from. Uh, some labs produce multiple versions, so in the right-hand column you can see CCSM4, which is a descendant of the NCAR model that I used to use. The next two below it, CESM1, are also products of, of the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, but one of the things that is uh, wonderful about this cooperation is that all of these modeling groups have agreed to do the same kinds of simulation using the same forcing data uh, to allow scientists to better compare the results from all these models. So it, it's produced uh, what are called the Coupled Model Intercomparison uh, Program, or CMIP, 
uh, runs, and currently CMIP 6 is underway. And these are the basis for uh, global assessments of, of climate science. Now, um, moving to the Northwest, um, one of the things that we've done uh, was to look at all of those models and compare them with observations uh, during the 20th century and start to distinguish the better models from the worst models. So over on the left, um, th those models are, are uh, among the best for the Northwest. Um, I won't try to explain the approach we used here. That's a seminar in and of itself. Um, but uh, we are, are um, uh, convinced that it's better to use um, uh, a subset of the models and uh, focus on the ones that perform best for the 20th century. Uh, so those are the ones over on the left in this diagram. So thinking about the future, there are three sources of what scientists call uncertainty. Um, and you remember Kavita's uh, cone of uncertainty that, you know, wherever we are now, um, there are a variety of directions that things could unfold in the future. Um, the first is the rate of emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, there's no question that we'll continue adding heat-trapping gases to the atmosphere. Uh, CO2 has a lifetime of many decades, so even if we uh, stopped emitting CO2 right now, uh, it would stay at quite high levels, uh, basically at today's levels for, for uh, quite a while. Um, so we need, we need ways to, to think about what the uh, trajectory of future emissions might be. The second um, source of uncertainty is the responsiveness of the climate system. Um, or another way to think of it, um, if you are fans of the Canadian uh, sport of curling, um, or I should say the Olympic sport of curling, which, uh, uh, of which Canadians are possibly the most passionate and fond, um, you, you, you push the stone and the question is how far will the stone go? Uh, in, in this case, um, we're pushing the climate system with carbon dioxide and the question is for a given amount of CO2, how much warming will we get and what other ways will the climate system respond? And the third, the third source of uncertainty is just randomness. Um, if we run a climate model um, and then we go back and start over and use the same external forcing of uh, carbon dioxide and uh, arbitrary volcanic eruptions and so on, um, if the initial state of the atmosphere is a little different, of course the whole simulation will be different and we would think of climate as being some kind of 30-year average. It turns out that even though the starting point um, doesn't really matter statistically, we do find that those 30-year simulations can, can result in somewhat different averages. So we have to uh, be at least cognizant of these sources of uncertainty, and we deal with them in different ways. So in the case of future emissions, um, a starting point is, you know, where will we get our electricity in the future? Will it be coal-fired power plants that continue to put CO2 in the atmosphere at quite a high rate per uh, unit of energy uh, produced? Um, Will we continue to drive extremely fuel inefficient vehicles? And when I say we, I mean not just the U.S., but also China, India, Brazil. Uh, what developing countries do uh, matters enormously. And so far they seem to be uh, in many ways copying us in wanting to live an energy intensive lifestyle uh, using electricity that is very carbon intensive to produce. Uh, so that is one possible future is, you know, high emissions of CO2 uh, uh, supporting a very uh, consumptive lifestyle. Um, another possible uh, s scenario is um, a very high reliance on renewable energy um, and, uh, you know, moving toward electric vehicles and other uh, low or zero emission uh, ways of, of accomplishing uh, the same task. So the way scientists have encapsulated all of those different uh, possible scenarios uh, is in what are called the representative concentration pathways, or RCPs. Um, uh, if you want to ask later, I can explain what the RCPs really are and what the numbers mean, but uh, what's shown here is a graph of four RCPs uh, mapped by their uh, global um, carbon dioxide emissions. And they also have other greenhouse gases associated with them. So RCP 8.5 envisions a world where you know, CO2 uh, uh, production uh, continues to increase very uh, dramatically and ends up tripling during this century. RCP 6.0 is a bit lower. Uh, RCP 4.5 uh, 
has emissions peaking in mid-century and then declining substantially. Uh, and that's, that's one that, you, that, that we uh, will use in subsequent diagrams as well as RCP 8.5. And then the green one, uh, which is known as RCP 2.6, um, it, uh, would have emissions dropping very rapidly after 2020, and you'll see actually going to zero by 2080 and then going negative. So in other words, um, humans in this scenario are, are actually doing more to take CO2 out of the atmosphere than to put it in. And if you think about the way we're currently living, um, even staying on something like RCP 4.5 would be quite difficult. Uh, RCP 2.6 approximately is the target of the Paris Agreement, although so far the nationally determined contributions that would or commitments that would contribute to this uh, uh, are, are far short of what would be needed to actually uh, reduce emissions this far. And I would uh, point out again, these are the rates at which CO2 is going into the atmosphere. So until CO2 emissions fall um, to the level at which nature can take them out, uh, and that would happen um, sometime around 2060 in the RCP 2.6 curve, um, anything above that level is continuing to um, accumulate CO2 in the atmosphere and, and accelerating warming. This is how those scenarios translate into global temperatures. Um, so RCP 8.5 is on top. The numbers in each panel are the number of models that ran that scenario. Um, many models went only to 2100. You can see there are a few that uh, proceeded beyond that. So the shape of warming is uh, quite different. RCP 8.5, uh, you see about uh, 4 degrees Celsius global temperature change during this century, but then that continues uh, for several more degrees of warming in subsequent centuries. Um, RCP 6.0, a bit lower. RCP 4.5, uh, temperatures stabilize at a couple degrees above uh, the 2000 level. Um, and then in RCP uh, 2.6, you can see temperatures level off and then uh, start to very, very slowly decrease. So we want to know those. So that, this is the emissions uh, uh, uncertainty. And then the spread of these represents the sensitivity or responsiveness of the different models. So there are some models that produce a high amount of warming uh, for a given amount of CO2, and some produce less. Um, but toward the end of the century, what matters the most is what um, emissions trajectory we're on. And so policy choices by the world uh, during this decade uh, will go a long way toward determining whether we are, we're on that dark blue stabilized low curve or the red um, continuing warming curve. Um, so this is a translation of those uh, graphs uh, instead of uh, in time. This is now across models and for the Northwest. So uh, it's a little bit complicated. I'll walk you through it. Um, on the left is the annual uh, temperature change projected by uh, a bunch of those models for the Northwest for the RCP 4.5 and 8.5 scenario. And the time frame is mid-21st century, so the years 2041 to 70, relative to late 20th century. So each dot is a model, and you can see that, uh, uh, first of all, there is a bit of a difference between RCP 4.5 and 8.5. Um, but there's more of a difference in what model uh, you pick. Um, so, this may, so you can see the, the very coolest model, uh, e even that one has one degree Celsius of northwest warming for the annual average. Uh, and the hottest model has over three and a half degrees Celsius. And the average is about uh, 2.4 degrees Celsius. Um, so quite a large spread among the models. And this is why it's important to use um, many models. If you just arbitrarily pick the one that was first in the alphabet or, you know, uh, something else, you could uh, end up with one that said one degree or uh, 3.6 degrees of warming. Uh, so that's one important point. Use lots of models if possible. Um, another thing to note here is that of all the seasons, uh, summer warms the most um, and, in fact, it is connected also with decreases in precipitation. Uh, and, and so the models with the largest increases in summer temperature also have the largest decreases in summer precipitation. Um, and and I, I don't have the precipitation diagram in here, but 
the precipitation results are actually straddling the zero line. So for any season, there's some models that'll say it'll get wetter and some that say it will get drier. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is, is the value of regional climate modeling. So uh, we here at OCRI uh, have been partnering with Oxford University for about 10 years. Uh, this shows the terrain and domain of the model that we're running. It's 25 kilometers spatial resolution. Uh, so you can see important features in the west like the uh, Willamette Valley, the Columbia Plateau, the Snake River Plain, and, and other things like that. Um, so this gives us a better chance of, of having simulations that represent important processes uh, for our region. And uh, this is then a similar map to the one I uh, showed you earlier, uh, or sorry, similar concept, which is how does the warming change with season? Uh, we're using slightly different dates here in the regional model, but upper left is winter and then spring, summer, and fall. So in winter and spring, the, the key feature that jumps out is that the mountains tend to warm more than the, the regional average. So you see some darker reds uh, in the Cascades um, and in the mountains of uh, northeastern Washington, uh, as well as central Idaho and the northern Rockies. And that's because of the snow albedo effect. So a bit of warming um, reduces the snow on the ground, which enhances the warming further. Um, and I talked earlier about the snow albedo feedback. It turns out it's, it's more complicated than that here because there are also interactions with cloud formation and persistence, things like that. Uh, so that's the main story in winter and spring. In summer, um, uh, this, this model, like many models, has more warming in summer than other seasons, so you see a lot of darker reds. Um, and that's more intense the, the farther east you go. Um, and right along the coast, you can see the warming is quite strongly um, suppressed by the fact that ocean water warms less than, than land. Uh, and that effect is uh, most obvious around the San, San Francisco Bay Area where you can actually see um, that uh, finger of marine influence suppressing the warming uh, well into the Central Valley. Uh, and the, the pattern in fall is a little bit like summer, but, but, but weaker. So that's um, uh, a very useful tool uh, for, for learning more about the shape of regional climate change. Um, this is the same thing, but for precipitation. And here it gets pretty interesting. Uh, so these are now percentage changes, which makes it easier to compare uh, across uh, wet and dry places. So the darker greens in the upper uh, left panel show that uh, much of eastern Washington uh, would have larger increases in winter precipitation than western Washington. And this has to do with what the bottle uh, suggests are uh, changes in atmospheric circulation and moisture transport. Um, spring uh, precipitation uh, doesn't actually change very much, and it's a little more uniform across the northwest, just a few percent. Um, summer, we can see drying, um, but this time a uh, larger percentage decrease in summer precipitation west of the Cascades than, than east of the Cascades. And then by the time you get to um, uh, Spokane area, northern Idaho, those percentages are, are, are back up to about what they were for, for western Washington. Um, so uh, I will wrap up here. Um, climate models uh, represent a huge amount of uh, detail of the climate system. I focused on just seasonal changes in temperature and precipitation, but they also simulate things like um, uh, extreme precipitation, uh, sunshine and cloudiness, uh, snow, and so forth. So uh, a lot of this is um, available to varying degrees from the, uh, the sorts of web portals that, that I introduced you to in, in May, the Climate Toolbox. Um, the, the paper that, that Ann emailed, um, uh, the EOS uh, paper from 2011, uh, pointed out some best practices, and I mentioned some of this here. Uh, it's best to use um, many climate models uh, to, uh, and to use uh, tested models. This, this will give a better estimate both of the, the average or mean change, but also for the range. Because um, we, we want to start thinking about that cone of uncertainty that Kavita mentioned. What is the, the, the sort of best case scenario, smallest amount of warming? What's the worst case scenario, large warming and you know, maybe, maybe big uh, changes in wildfire and so on? 
Uh, another point on best practices is to be aware of the limitations. So a lot of the tools that are um, available use global models, which have their value. Um, they, they can't say much about the texture of regional change. They don't resolve the mountains well enough to give a good snow albedo feedback, for instance. So it's helpful to, to think about that. Um, so global models have their role. They provide the context, uh, the, the responsiveness of the global system, the sea ice, uh, El Ninos, and then the regional models are important to start getting uh, details right. So I'll stop there and be happy to take questions. All right, if there's no questions from the phone yet, so I do have a question. Um, so during, so you've been, you've done a bunch of these projects and stuff with other communities, and so what kind of comes up as like the, the questions and sticky points that you hear from community members when they're looking at models and applying them to their community? Uh, it depends uh, enormously on the sort of technical capacity and level of interest in climate modeling. Um, I did a project with a community probably 15 years ago where we spent the first three meetings um, uh, kind of hung up because one of the participants had read enough climate modeling papers to know that simulating clouds was a challenge and so wanted to push back on the use of climate models because they have trouble with clouds. And um, so that was, you know, quite, quite a surprising um, uh, side eddy to get to get dragged into. Um, on on the, the, the other extreme, um, you know, if if you don't know very much about climate models, um, it can and you think in terms of a weather forecast, um, it can be quite a, a, an interesting journey to help people understand the difference between a weather model, which is trying to predict the exact state of the atmosphere over the next seven to ten days and a climate model which is trying to simulate, you know, many decades and the important thing is not exactly the state in a given day or month, but rather how the system responds to these kinds of external forcing. So um, part of it is, is having this conversation about when do and don't you use climate models, what are good sources, um, and then, uh, you know, really some of the most fascinating examples uh, in, in a companion project to the Puma project that Kavita described, we did a, a Puma project with Seattle Public Utility. And one of the questions they posed to us was, um, how will the timing of the fall rains change? Because the stressful point of the, the year for uh, a lot of western surface water utilities is end of summer, beginning of fall, uh, you know, supply uh, in the form of new precipitation is below demand for many, many months. So you're drawing down your reservoir, and that stops when the rains return. That, that uh, rains uh, greatly decrease demand and increase supply. So we had this interesting back and forth with what do you consider the definition of the return of the fall rains? And how can we translate that into something that, the, that we can get from the climate models? And what we ended up with was uh, seven-day total precipitation was, I think, was two and a half inches. Um, and so that typically happens sort of in October. And so we were able to uh, answer that question. Great. I think we have, we have time for one, one more question from the from those on the um, on the phone. Okay, then um, in that case, what I might do is uh, recommend that we pause here. Um, I know that that was a ton of information that we just uh, kind of offered offered up. So again, if, if things come up, um, you know, please feel free to contact us um, and you know send questions our way. Um, I'd also like to just another big thank you to Phil and Kavita and Casey for um, sharing their expertise with, expertise with us today. Um, and a quick reminder that we'll post this all on the website and I'll send out a, a notice onto the, the listserv and um, 
and also that we're planning our next webinar for um, later in August, where we'll hear more from John Abatsaglu using some of the data and um, resources that you guys came up with in May and that um, CERC has been, has been researching over the last couple of months. Um, so with that, um, oh, last, last thing you'll see on, uh, we, had, we had mentioned before when, when Denise, um, Denise is on vacation today, but um, she had shared that we like to have a, a record of how everything went. So you'll see there's a link to, um, to a survey in the agenda that I emailed you. So um, if you have a couple of minutes, um, it shouldn't take you more than a minute or two. Um, just let us know uh, what you thought. We greatly appreciate your feedback, as that really helps us as, our, as we plan our next um, engagement. Um, with that, we are um, right on time, so I'll let you guys get back to your days, and thank you again for um, coming on with us today. Thank you. Bye, Anne. Bye. Thanks.